just take a look to that one. Let's see if this works better because I don't have any sound. Now my hi my. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike O'Leary. I'm a regional manager for Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand, and I'll be your host today. Um, quick reminder about what sharing knowledge sessions are. We've been running these for about a year now, um, and we try for New Zealand audiences to run them between 12 and one o'clock on a Friday afternoon. They're always current, they're always topical, um, they bring with them an hour's CPD, and um, I know importantly to a lot of chartered accountants um, in today's uh, not-for-profit audience, they are free. Um, this one we're doing uh, in terms of the trust law changes is one of a series that uh, Andrew and I have been discussing. Um, Andrew and I have a, a close relationship through a number of things, such as the Charity Law Accounting and Regulation Conference and uh, reporting awards. Um, so uh, please provide feedback at the end of the session about um, how you enjoyed it, and um, we'll look at other topics as well. Um, today, we're going to explore um, the implications of the recent um, legislative change to trust laws. Um, and what impact they're having on charities and not-for-profits. Uh, and like I say, this is the first of a series. Um, tell us any other topics at the end of this that you might like to see. To help inform us today, we have Andrew Phillips, uh, Manager of Engagement and Business Improvement Charity Services at DIA. Uh, and we also have Vicky Munston, the Director of Vicky Munston Trust Law. Hi, guys. Hello. So, um, so welcome to you both. Um, I'm just going to run through the format for today. Um, so first off, Andrew's going to uh, introduce the topic for us for about five or 10 minutes with some slides. Uh, and then Vicky's going to actually take us through um, some of the detail of the, of the legal changes. Um, we've set aside uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, at the end, as we suspect, uh, this topic's going to generate a lot of um, interaction and questions. Um, rather than you uh, sort of trying to um, butt in. Um, can you actually add the questions into chat? Um, I will be, uh, me and Megan, who's our producer today, will be keeping an eye on those and seeing if we can pick out the really um, interesting ones there. Um, so Andrew, can you tell us first off a bit about your role at uh, Charity Services? Absolutely. Um, I'm the Manager um, Engagement and Business Improvement at Charity Services. Um, I look after our information systems, reporting, standards, compliance um, work, our front-facing customer support team, and our capability team that looks to build sector capability through resources, engagement events, and website materials. I've been in charity services about nine years, and I've had experience across most um, areas in the business. So, um, yeah, I've, I've been following the, the developments of the trust law quite closely, and I'm quite um, excited about speaking today. Thank you. And tell me, is this um, uh, change in legislation going to affect all trusts or is it just some we're looking at today? Um, so, so today we're, we're focusing um, on the impacts to charitable trusts, um, and but it, it does impact all trusts, um, mm -hmm. and, but we won't be dealing with the details for the, for the other trusts. Um, so this, this really does focus on charities and non-profits. Right. And um, would you like to lead us into the topic? Absolutely. Um, so over the next 10 minutes or so, um, I'm going to briefly introduce what we do as a group, how trust fits in our register and the basic duties we expect all officers of charities to comply with. Um, I'll then pass over to Vicky, um, who will discuss the specifics of the changes and what it means for the trust that you're involved in. Um, so Charity Services administers the Charities Act, which has a purpose of promoting public trust and confidence in charities um, and the effective use of charitable resources. Our vision at Charity Services um, is that uh, we contribute to a well-governed, transparent and thriving charitable sector with strong public support. We know that charities themselves are the key drivers of public trust and confidence. So our focus is ensuring the responsible people in charities have the knowledge they need to meet their legal obligations. Um, one of our main functions is the maintenance of the charities register. Um, the Charities Register is a public record of all the information of New Zealand's over 27,000 registered charities. The register summarises each charity's purposes, activities, key people, 
involved and includes their annual returns. Registration as a charity is voluntary and certain benefits and obligations come with registration. Um, the main benefits relate to tax, like um, donors getting tax credits on their donations and an income tax exemption. The main obligation is to file annual returns, um, annual reports and financial statements that meet final financial reporting standards. Just, just in case you're worried about having to take curious notes from the slides, we will, we will provide these slides after that. Um, there's nothing contentious. Um, charities are, um, so now I'll talk a little about trusts on the register. Charities that any trust or society or um, institution that meets the charitable purpose test and aren't operated for private benefit or profit. That includes a lot of different entities, companies, incorporated societies, or just a group of people bound together by a rules document. Um, but just over half of all charities are trusts. I've got a little graphic here demonstrating the breakup of the register. Um, now, trusts are legally binding agreements where a person transfers legal ownership of property to certain people called trustees to be held, usually for a third party. In the case of charities, the third party is the public benefit delivered by charitable purpose. Um, charitable purpose. Trusts exist in two forms on the charities register. Private trusts and incorporated charitable trust boards both have trustees and duties under the law. Incorporating as a trust board under the Charitable Trust Act 1957 is an important step if trusts want to apply for funding. A lot of funders require you to have an incorporated structure, but it's not necessary to be incorporated to register as a charity. It is also important if your trust is going to employ people or engage in contracts with other parties, the body corporate form limits your liability as individual trustees. Um, now, trustees for both forms have certain duties set by court decisions. And previously, there were certain rules under the Trustees Act 1956 that applied. There are also basic duties that all people responsible for charities have. The Trust Act 2019, we're talking about today, hasn't changed these fundamental duties, but has clarified certain things that charities need to be aware of. The most important duty for trustees is loyalty to the trust. This means that charitable purpose, the reason for the trust existing, must guide trustee decision making. Every meeting you have, every minor decision and big decision, you should be considering how you are seeking to further your charitable purpose. Where we see things go wrong in charities, most of the time it is where a charity loses sight of its charitable purpose and allows private benefits or other interests to interfere with decision making. I think it's always worth reflecting. Are we doing something because we've always done it? Or is it because of our purpose? It's an important thing that all charities should be thinking about. And um, part of meeting this duty leads neatly into another essential duty, know your trustees. This can be challenging because some trustees are old and almost all trustees have language that doesn't always make sense on the 14th read through. But understanding what your purpose is and what powers you have to carry out that purpose are essential things for you to know if you're going to carry out your duties as trustees. Now, I'm gonna pass over to Vicky to talk a little bit more about the trust sacks and what has changed and what it means for charities and what um, you might need to do to change in your trustees. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. And um, Vicky, please um, take us through the, uh, the detail. Thank you. And, and I'd like, like to really endorse Andrew's comments because one of the fundamental problems with trusts, whether it's a charitable trust or any sort of trust, is in New Zealand, we love trusts. No one knows why New Zealanders love trusts so much or and the fact that you know a charity doesn't have to be a trust, but for whatever reasons, New Zealand culture has developed a huge number of our charities are trusts. And in the background, we've had that this Trusts Act, we've got the Charities Act, which, which governs aspects of charitable trusts, but charitable trusts are still governed by trust law. And while we've now got a Trusts Act, the purpose of which is to restate and clarify that law, it is also, we still have the, the common law in the background. And so, being a trustee, it's a huge responsibility because it's it's not just that you you want to you you're involved with the charity because you believe in the purposes, um, you support them, you take on enormous responsibilities which are not always fully appreciated. So if you can just move me to the next slide, please. 
So first off, I'm going to talk to you about the Trusts Act and I've just pulled out a few sections of the Trusts Act that will give you some clarity and, and guidance, I hope. One of the difficulties for charities is that the Trusts Act applies to all trusts if they meet the requirements of a trust for the Act, and they don't necessarily it doesn't necessarily clarify when that specifically applies to a charity. And so there's this new definition of express trust. And this, this unfortunately is a relatively legal term which doesn't have a huge amount of relevance to anybody. But what an express trust is, is it is a trust that has certain characteristics and effectively the Trust Act applies to all express trusts. So if you can take me to the next slide. So the characteristics are, and there's two aspects of the characteristics of an express trust. The first, touching on what Andrew talked about, is this fiduciary relationship, sometimes referred to as a relationship or obligations of the highest loyalty and fidelity. And the entire point of of a trust is that it reflects the fact that we've got trustees who are often referred to or thought of as the legal owners of the trust property. But they're not just holding this property, they're holding this property for either in the context of say a normal family trust, the beneficiaries with a charitable trust, you might think of that more often as the permitted purpose. And so the trustees, they hold this property, but their sole obligation or responsibility is to manage the property for, the, for the, that, that purpose. And the trustee must be accountable. And so when you're looking at your trust rules, some trusts might really water down the rules so that if trustees get it wrong, make mistakes, don't deal with things properly, they're not going to have any liability. Because often what's overlooked when people accept appointment as trustee is it feels like it's an honour or a sign of respect, when in fact um, it, it can be sometimes what we refer to as the ultimate hospital pass. Because you've taken on the responsibility, because you, you've got this goal or this, you know, this vision or this charity that you feel really passionate about, but the trustees don't always really fully understand what their obligations are. And so the first characteristic that must be there for a valid trust is these obligations that of, of loyalty and, and then that you, the trustee is accountable. And, and there's fortunately in the charity space, you're almost ahead of the game compared with a lot of other trusts because there's already been for registered charities a whole lot of transparency and accountability. So you've actually got a bit of an advantage. But the next slide goes through the other aspect of being a trust and that is how does this trust get created? Generally, it's going to, there's going to be a trust deed and charity services will refer to that as your rules. And although you don't have to have a written trust document or rules to meet the criteria of a charity. You cannot register as a charity without rules. And so those requirements are, are easily satisfied for charities because you have to have some rules for, that will satisfy charity services. And what those rules do is they identify what is the purpose of the charity. And again, that goes back to Andrew's comment. You've got this permitted purpose that is set out in your rules always being very clear about what that is and going back and revisiting is incredibly important so that you don't lose your way. And the other aspect of a valid trust is that there must be some identifiable trust property. It doesn't have to be very much. There's no minimum threshold of how much you have to have to, to be you know, any kind of trust, but there must be identifiable property. So then all that all that this means for charitable trusts is that the same test that will determine if you are a trust or not apply for charitable trust, the same as they do for any other discretionary trust in New Zealand. But there are some provisions where there is a different treatment for charities. So on the next slide, we're going to talk about the maximum duration. One of the things that the Trusts Act has done is it has changed how long a trust can run for in New Zealand. So if you are a discretionary trust, you could run for up to 80 years, and there are a few complicated rules around that. Now those trusts can run for 125 years. However, this does not apply to charities. Charities can continue indefinitely. And that is, and the reason for that is that the whole point of charities is the fact that 
charities are effectively doing what might otherwise be the job of the government. And so the government has a very vested interest in ensuring properly run and properly managed charities because they can last indefinitely. And But with this comes the, 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 the practical reality. If you think about your trust roles, and some of you might now be sort of thinking, oh my goodness, well, I know we've got some, there's a deed somewhere. You know, if we could do a show of hands now for who last read their trust deed, it might have some people for, look, awkwardly updating their Facebook status, taking an important phone call, because it's very common to sort of lose sight of that because you kind of all know what you're doing and why you're there. And you don't often, and, and I know this from, from, you know, charities who come to me for advice, they'll, they'll be doing something and they're trotting along their merry way. And then for some reason, someone checks the trust deed and then they'll come to me saying, hey, we've got a problem. Our, our rules, we didn't realize it says this. We've been doing that. But this is what the deed says. What can we do about it? And so one of the, the, the issues that charities have to confront is because they can last indefinitely, those rules need to be reviewed from time to time because think laws change, time passes on. Sometimes charities quite properly you know, there's been an evolution of the charity so that the constraints they've got, it's not that they're doing anything improper, it's simply that their rules are perhaps no longer in line with what they do. And one good thing about the Trust Act is that it's forcing people, whether you are the trustees of a charitable trust or any other trust, to go back and review your rules and actually determine whether are our rules still fit for purpose? Uh, do our rules still reflect what we're doing, how we do it? And, and sometimes when you read the rules, you might get a little bit of a surprise. There's a case of um, a fairly recent trust case um, involving a charitable trust um, called Butterfield. And in that case, there was nothing wrong with what the trustees were doing. It's just that they'd lost sight of their rules and hadn't realized that all of their appointments as trustees had come to an end. So they'd been carrying on acting as trustees, but their appointment was no longer valid. And what the court said there is the court treated them as a de facto trustee and said, even though your appointments come to an end, you were still acting properly and, and the issue became one of their costs because of, of the court proceedings. And the court said, in these circumstances, you've acted properly, so you can still be, re, you know, your costs can still be met from the trust. But what it highlights is because trust can last for so long, there is a really important need to be regularly reviewing the terms of the trust and making sure that you're still acting in accordance. And now that we've got the Trusts Act, that means it is also really important to make sure, because as well as introducing this maximum duration, the Trusts Act has introduced what is now called default duties and mandatory duties. Now, for most charitable trusts, these, this should be of no concern because charitable trusts tend to be run on stricter terms than, say, your average discretionary family trust. You know, the trustees can't personally benefit from the trust because it's fundamental to a charitable trust, particularly for your the income tax benefits that you can have, that no person in a position of control or power can benefit or manipulate benefits. And, and with a charitable trust, of course, you're not holding assets, you know, like, like you are the family trust, you know, for a small family group. You're holding them, you know, for these, these purposes or sometimes referred to as the objects. But because of the way the Trust Act is drafted, and I'm not criticising the legislators, but unfortunately, you get a new piece of legislation. It hasn't been drafted by legislators who sat there and trawled through charity services and looked at the way charitable trustees are drafted any more than they went and looked at the way, you know, the very many ways that discretionary trusts are drafted. So it and, and, and the whereas the Trustee Act was far more specific to particular things that happened, so changes would happen that was an, and so things were draft deeds were drafted in light of the Trustee Act that we had previously, but now with this overarching Trusts Act, what that means is there may be provisions of your 
trust rules or your trust deed that need to be reviewed in light of the Trusts Act because of this overlay of default and mandatory duties. And I'm not going to talk about that in any more detail today because we could do an ent the entire session on just one of the duties. But that's just a heads up under the idea of the fact that trusts do last for a long time and need to be regularly reviewed, not just because of the Trusts Act, but because of what you do and how you do it may change over time. But one, the thing I'm going to talk about next on the next slide is one of the things that perhaps is concerning a lot of trustees of charitable trusts, because this is the aspect of the Trust Act that has had the most publicity. And this is because the whole reason we got the Trust Act, there has been concern for about the last 20 years that the management of trusts is not good enough. And, and again, this doesn't really apply to charitable trusts because ever since we got the, the Charities Act and because of charitable services, there's a lot of regulation of charitable trusts. Now, you don't have to register as a charitable trust. You can be charitable and not register, but that's relatively unusual. Most charities register because they want to be able to get the tax benefits and so that, that you know they can the funds they've got can be better utilized for their purposes or objects. And so you sort of come at this as a bit of an advantage compared with, with trustees of other trusts. But the thing I think that's caused the most consternation is this presumption regarding provision of basic trust information to beneficiaries. And so where this came from is that through the review that ended up with the Trusts Act, at the very start, the Law Commission decided there would be no register of trusts. There was, there was no need to tell all the beneficiaries because for goodness sake, imagine how hard it would be to be a trustee if the beneficiaries kept pestering you. We can't have that kind of nonsense. But through the fullness of the review, there were greater concerns that, that started to be realised is that, well, if there's no obligation to tell beneficiaries, how can you ensure the due and proper administration of the trust? And so what we ended up with is this new presumption in the Trusts Act that trustees will tell every beneficiary. So you can imagine you're a trustee of a charitable trust. That's going to seem pretty onerous. How will you do that? Well, good news, the gift that charities have from the Trusts Act is those provisions do not apply to charities. However, many charities think they do simply because that's the area of the Trust Act that has had the most publicity. And if you think about it, if you're a charity registered with charity services, your rules, who can, you know, who can benefit from your charity, who might be making funding applications if you're a charity that's, you know, in the business of, of largely providing grants for other charities, that's all out there in the public domain. You're kind of way ahead of the game than other trusts because you've had a level of accountability and reporting obligations that other trusts haven't had for quite some time. But the reason I've talked about this a little bit, which might seem a bit absurd when I say, hey, don't worry about it, is I think it's important to understand why there's a different rule for charities and why so many of you might think you have this obligation or might be being told. I've seen letters being sent out from, from lawyers and accountants with, with the greatest of intentions giving information about the Trusts Act that goes out to every client who's a trust. But unfortunately, they haven't sort of thought, oh, but our charitable client trusts, this doesn't apply to them. So there's been some misinformation out there, well-intentioned, but nevertheless, not correct. But on the next slide, some information that is correct and is really important is about the core documents. And again, as charities, you've got quite an advantage here because again, you are under a more regulated sort of paradigm and there's more, ref more understanding and, and appreciation of your documents and what you've got to have shown on the website. But you will have other documents that don't have to be um, provided on the website, but nevertheless, are what come under the category of core documents. And what the Trust Act has introduced is a definition now of core documents and an obligation that 
every trustee in the first instance is expected to hold all of these documents and you can see all of them on the screen in front of you so I'm not going to read them out to you but you will see that's actually quite a lot. Fortunately if we move to the next slide you get a little bit of help here and so what the law says now is where there's more than one trustee so long as every trustee has the trust deed um, or a copy of the trust deed and any deeds of variation, so long as one trustee holds all of the documents, you meet the obligation and the documents must be retained for the duration of the trusteeship and they must be passed on to other trustees when there is a replacement. However, what that means is that as a practical level, you are going to have to be deciding as trustees how we're going to meet that obligation. And when you've got a charitable board, is it the obligation of the board? Is it the obligation of the trustees that comprise the board? My views is that obligation still sits with the trustees that comprise the board. I know there are other views out there. What I strongly recommend for charities is that you have a document portal and that if you've got the ability to do so, you amend your rules to provide that you can meet your document keeping obligations by holding electronic copies. But that means you are going to have to make sure that that, that portal is secure, that all the trustees can access it, that you've got protocols for updating and for anyone who's recently tried to open a bank account or take on a new investment advisor. Someone has to know, you've got to also keep track of where the originals are because for a lot of things you still require the original deed. If, for example, you decide you're going to incorporate now, someone's going to have to certify that this is an original copy of the trust deed. And so having a system that, you know, identifies where the originals are still held, ideally they should be in a fire safe cabinet. And if they're held by your lawyer or accountant, then it's entirely appropriate to check that they've got insurance for in the event those documents are destroyed. So the document keeping one, it is a really important one and it's part of the whole sort of approach of the Trust Act so that there's more accountability, more visibility and that there's a better appreciation of those duties and obligations. And the last slide I'm going to talk about is reviewing decisions because one of the aspects of the, the Trust Act that I've already touched on, it is very much one size fits all and charitable trusts sometimes might feel that you're a little bit more protected because you know you're doing good works you know you're out there supporting the community supporting society however a trustee of a charitable trust is no more immune from inquiry than the trustee of a family trust or you know a trading trust or a financial investment trust and so while the trust act does not um, in any way overstep the boundaries of the charitable trust act or the Charity, Charities Act, what it does do is that there is the ability for um, you know, certain parties to request um, a review of any decision or omission or anything a trustee has done or, or not done. And so it can only, and so what that means is as a charity is that there can be times you come under scrutiny and so trustees of charities need to be making sure that they understand you're not just doing a good thing. You are doing a good thing, but you've got an incredible level of accountability and a huge level of responsibility. And so as charities, you I don't think there's any need to be afraid of or concerned about the Trust Act. It's actually an opportunity to review your terms, re make sure that they are fit for purpose. And, and if you've started to deviate or if they're not, look at what's a practical solution focused approach going to be because the work of charities in society is phenomenally important and it's often said when you end up with you know charitable disputes ending up in the court because the funds that should be going to the purposes are being used on litigation unnecessarily and so now is a marvelous opportunity for a spring clean so that you can all be getting on with doing the stuff that's the most important thank you And that's me. <laughs> Thank you, Vicky. Um, what was a really uh, yet? Yeah, well, not yet because um, I can see. Uh, I'm here for the questions. questions coming in, and I'm I'm going to be the uh, 
arbiter of deciding who gets to answer them. But there's a couple of um, fairly uh, ones directly related to what you've been talking about. And the first one is in relation to um, the increase from 80 years to indefinite. Um, does that mean the charity is going to have to go back and change their deed? No, sorry if I didn't make myself clear enough. That change, that change to 125 years only applies to discretionary trusts. Charitable trusts had and continue to have an, an indefinite um, period. So there's no limit on how long a charity can can act, can run. But I will say one thing there. I have reviewed some charitable trust deeds that have a trust period in them, which is extraordinary because one of the you know fundamental benefits and important aspects of a charity is that they can last indefinitely. And so from time to time, I have seen deeds that do refer to a period, but that's not, a charity can last indefinitely. Right. Um, and actually sort of on the back of that, there's a number of them flowing through as well. So I'm going to do my best to try and keep up. Um, there's a question about the process for amending trusts, because I know some trust deeds are quite rigid and don't allow for amendments to them. Um, is that an issue? Yes. <laughs> um, and, and Andrew Andrew is going to talk you through how you change your trust deed. So I won't steal his thunder. But what I will say is, if you don't have a power of variation in a trust deed, then that can be problematic. Sometimes for some trusts that are so inflexible, some trustees may decide that the best option if they have got a power to resettle or a termination provision that allows them to resettle onto an aligned charity, that that's the best option. However, if you don't, if you if you need to make changes, then it's a court application, and you don't have a power of variation, it's a court application. And I think that often charities often feel like we can't afford it, you know, we don't have enough money. Fortunately, because these things happen relatively routinely, if you need to make changes and you don't have the power to do so, it's far better to, to confront the reality and get legal assistance and a court order varying the trust. It is not as comp it often might seem a bit complicated. You do need to do what's called lay a scheme before the Attorney General. The Attorney General normally charges a fee of $750. And what happens is the, requ the variations required, the basis for them are determined in advance. The Attorney General reviews it and then writes a report that's filed with the application so the court can make the orders required to vary the trust. Some changes can be done without the um, approved requirement of the assistance of the Attorney General but the point of the Attorney General with trust is effectively the Attorney General has this overarching responsibility for trusts and so when variations are required they make their job is to make sure that they were in line with the purposes of the trust and you know that 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 is an it's like they have Effectively speak for the beneficiaries to ensure that the court can be satisfied that the variation is appropriate. And I know it can be confronting and daunting, but I urge anyone who's got concerns with their charitable trust and the fact that they need to vary it to, you know, to get good legal advice and act on it rather than cross your fingers and hope for the best because it'll come to a sticky end at some point. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, because I think that might be one of the major uh, impediments when we go back in and look at deeds, see how flexible they are. Um, and just following on in there, um, one of the, the comments has come through on chat that um, all trust decisions now have to be unanimous. Um, and we know what people are like and committees are like and um, groups of trustees. Is there any guidance through that part of the uh, the, the, there is what the trust what the trust act says is that uh, the unanimity is a default duty, not a mandatory duty. So what that means is that decisions must be unanimous unless that section or, unless there's been a modification or exclusion in the trust deed. And and this is a a really um, interesting area because at the moment all of us as as legal practitioners, trust practitioners, we're doing our Best. We've got new legislation and what I say to my clients is the advice I give one day may change in the next few months when we start to get decisions from the courts. So what you have to do is um, most, in my experience, most trust deeds actually allow for majority decision making. So that means you have actually modified the Trusts Act and so you're probably okay. 
I say probably because what you've got to read every clause in light of the act and to and make a decision have we ad, does this adequately modify it and what i find is the biggest problem is that um, with a trust deed and particularly charitable trusts is that you might have a clause that says for at the meetings or when we do this um, the, um, a decision is made by the majority of the trustees at the decision or a quorum is this many trustees and you've got a clear clause that allows for majority decision making and so that's going to modify that default duty. So that's fine. But then you might have another clause in the trust deed that has been drafted without really thinking about the, the, the other aspects of it that doesn't allow, that doesn't, so you don't have a full modification. If you've got a power of variation, that's great. You can, you can go back and have an amendment that makes it clear. If you don't, you're going to have to be looking very carefully at which clause of a trust deed you're acting under to establish whether or not you have to have a majority. Because the practical reality is, because charitable trusts tend to have more trustees than you know than other trusts, having all of your trustees there in an agreement, well, you know, big ups if you can do it. But but it's a pr practically it's very challenging. And um, Vicky, I'm going to give you a little break now and see if we can uh, test Thank Andrew's you. knowledge or <laughs> we'll share the questions around as well. There's a, um, a, a couple of linked questions come through on chat, one around um, the core documents um, and a question whether the core documents need to be held by the chair of the trust or you need to nominate a, a different trustee. And in conjunction with that, does it have to be paper and or electronic? Would you like me to answer that now? I think Vicky, I think that's definitely you. I think you covered that in okay. your um, presentation. I, I think it's been covered, but but one thing I would say, um, without having got Andrew's consent, if there's more questions than we can answer today, I'm very happy to have those sent to me and to prepare um, responses to those questions if that would be helpful. And I, th I see Andrew agreeing there. I think maybe it's a task we as panelists will take on that we'll um we'll collate these and see what the common themes are and, and answer them. Um, there's another one that may well uh, work for you, Andrew, um, and it's the responsibility of officers. Uh, and there's two or three there with slightly different um, foci. Do, would you like to talk about the responsibility of officers? Um, that's a that's a very broad um, question. The responsibility <laughs> of uh, officers. So officers under the Charities Act, um, when it comes to trusts, they're the trustees of the trust. Um, that's quite strongly defined. If it's any other entity, it's um, essentially either the um, members of the board or people in position of um, significant um, influence over management or administration. Um, but when it comes to the trust, it's not your CEO, it's just your, um, your trustees. Um, I think that I think the Trust Act is very, um, very explicit around what duties officers have. Um, and rather than I think, as, as Vicky mentioned, trying to go through that in detail would be its own, each one would be its own, um, own, um, own, um, own webinar. But um, I think what, what I mentioned earlier about um, the, the duties are know your trust deed is a really important one but for the under the charities act there are two very specific um, obligations that offer officers have um and and, th and this is an obligation that the whole charity has but also the individual officers have that's to make sure you're providing annual reporting to charity services and to um and to update us with any changes um and, and then there are specific changes that you have to update. And one of the great things about the Charities Register is to a certain extent, it operates as a um, repository for your um, rules document. If you're keeping that updated, you have a, a elect electronic copy of your rules. Now, some lawyers might disagree with this. Um, <laughs> I've had this argument with my partner a few times, who's a lawyer who doesn't always um, um, completely agree, but from charity services perspective, if you've got access to the charity register, that will have your rules and your variations, or it should have. If you're not updating us, um, I'll, uh, later in the webinar, I'm just gonna go over the how you do that in detail. Um, but um, I think that's, that's, I mean, if that's in a few minutes, um, some of the obligations. If you've got anything more specific, I'm happy to cover that. Vicky might, might wanna pick up on that and say anything she thinks. 
Ricky, is there I, anything? I, I endorse Andrew's comments. I, I think that it's it's a webinar in itself, and it might be the material for another one of these webinars. But I, I would say that what you've said encapsulates the position really well. Okay. Um, I'm uh, seeing a number of questions coming in that are reasonably similar as well. Um, and I might put this to you first, Andrew. And it's around um, trustees making decisions that they can benefit from. So does that mean that we can't have paid trustees? And there's a similar one coming through around, um, are there any sort of um, general guidelines around honorariums and um, accounting fees? So, I think that it's first important to, to note that one of the most important things about being an officer is that you're, you act for the best interest of the charity and not for your private benefit. Um, that doesn't mean you can't be paid a market rate for your services and um, for the charity, especially for a lot, and um, uh, most of you will be probably involved in a charity. You'll be aware that trustees are doing work for the charity all the time. You're probably a trustee on a lot of charities and do accounting work for your charity. It's completely acceptable. And it's an important rider to that, as, as um, Vicky mentioned in relation to unanimous um, decision making, this is one of the default duties um, that you cannot be remunerated for your um, for your time as a um, as an officer so that has to be really clear in your rules document now this hasn't changed this has always been the case in the common law so this is just um this is just making it really clear in legislation i know for some charities that will be a little bit of a surprise but that's where those though that the comments around amendments are really uh, really important and reviewing your rules now to make sure that your current practices when it comes to benefits are aligning with your um with your rules document to make sure you're acting, um, acting consistently with those. Fantastic. And um, I think I might come back to you as well. Um, and I can see, uh, th and the, the function of a chat and questions in these is fantastic because people can ask those questions that maybe they're scared to ask otherwise. But I've got a note here that says, um, uh, I run a trust that doesn't have much money. Do I have to go and see a lawyer to make changes to my trust deed or how do I do it cheaply? Great question. And I'm not sure Vicky will like my answer here. <laughs> and well, so there's two, there's two options that we suggest to, to charities. You can always, um, so we've got um, weekly clinics, um, so that you can always give us a, um, um, a range of Zoom clinic one-on-one. -on -one. We're happy to talk through these things with you. So we'll give you a little bit of advice. It's not legal advice, definitely not, but it can give you the basics. Um, Community Net Aotearoa, this week we um, uploaded a new document, which is just a very simple, template deed of variation which will allow you to do these these things yourself now if you own property if you own any I'm, I'm really talking to the small charities here with very little money if you own property if you employ a lot of people that's where you really should be talking to a lawyer this has got more significant consequences and you've got to really think these things through if it's minor changes um, then trying to do it yourself is completely acceptable as long as you follow um, follow the rules. And as, as I mentioned a, a little bit later, I will go through those rules. I mean, if I don't get time, I'll, I can I will send them out as part of the um, materials. Um, but also, I, I would endorse Andrew's comments there because. Uh, unfortunately, the, the reality is that legal fees are expensive. And again, if you've got property and there's more significant considerations, but a lot of variations being required right now, they are very important, but they're often very simple and very straightforward. It's, it's when you've got, you know, if you don't have a power of variation or it's a very limited one, you know, I would urge you to get legal advice. But I really encourage, you know, a lot of the, you know, the templates that, you know, is, are being provided so that people don't have to use the, the cost as a barrier. Because, you know, I, I, as a legal professional, I do reflect and appreciate that the point of charities is to support the objects and purposes, not, to, not you know, not to, you know, fund lawyers. But don't tell my other clients that. <laughs> We, we might have to uh, pull this off the website. Um, but uh, in a very, very similar way, we've got another question. Is there a template for a trust deed that incorporates all the new, new changes? And there's a question, where can I access? And I suspect there's a question in the back, is it free? Yes. So um, Community Centre Aotearoa, and um, we've recently uploaded a um, version of the um, template trust deed, which has um, changes necessary. It's a little bit clunky um, and it's something that we've, we've been reflecting on um, as a unit that it's not really speaking to the charitable sector in their language, but um, as far as we're concerned, um, as far as we're concerned um, um, and we've got, we've got 
um, advice on this, it, it meets the requirements. So um, you can use that. So if you just go to Community Center Aotearoa, we'll, we'll include the link in the um, notes that we send out um, you, and search for charitable trustee, you'll, you'll find that as well as the data variation. And Andrew, I think following on from that, the process would be the, the trust comes together, agrees that, minutes it. Um, do then they have to send the updated trust deed to charity services and the company's office? Absolutely, Mike. I actually have um, a little spiel on this that I might quickly go over now. Um, so once you have your deed, you've got it agreed and signed at a trust meeting. Um, also, uh, make sure your um, signature is witnessed by an independent per uh, person if that's required in your deed. Um, next um, step is to get those um, the two registers updated. Now, there are two registers. Not everyone will be um, incorporated as a um, charitable trust and not everyone will be registered as a charity. So depending on which combination you are, you will have to update us, charity services and um, the, ch the company's office, the incorporated society's registrar. Um, if you need to go to the Incorporated Societies um, Registrar, we recommend doing that first. It's just um, the, the sensible way of going about it. There's a form on their website called CT3. Um, if you search for changing your rules, Google search, change, change my rules, um, charitable trust, you'll find it pretty easily. That pretty much takes you step by step what you need to do. Once you've got that form filled out, um, and there are certain, um, it's got certain things you'll need to do in that form, and I won't go over the detail there. Um, once you've got that form filled out, submit it to the um, charitable, tr charitable um, the, um, incorporated, um, incorporated trust registrar. Then um, you can um, update your details on the charities register. Go on charities.gov.nz, um, log onto your account, um, update your details, click the update details button, go through. You don't need to change anything else. Just go to change your rules, upload that exact same document. You don't need to change anything and certify and submit and you'll be done. Now, if it's an if it's an administrative change, if it's a simple change, this will be, in the past, it would have taken quite a while to update the charities register. Now we'll update really quickly, although we do recommend just um, check in after a couple of days to make sure that the, um, the, uh, the trustee is updated on our register. In fact, you can bookmark your individual charities um, entry on the charities register. So if you want to check it at any time, you've got it. And also you can send it out to your um, supporters to let them know that you are registered as a charity. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was, uh, I'm glad I asked you a question that you're well briefed on. That's a comprehensive answer. Thanks, Andrew. Now, I've got a question and I'm going to read this one, which I don't usually, um, but it's a bit technical. And I'll just say, um, and it questions through the payment of trustees. What practical steps do you recommend if exclusion of interested trustees from decision making is not possible? And that's because all trustees are interested in the matter. Um, and they're asking whether there should be third party advice or benchmarking in something in that regard. Um, I suppose, yeah, I, I think um, I think those those recommendations are pretty good. Third party advice, independent advice, really important. But our, our preference in these situations is that um, is that an independent trustee can be appointed, but sometimes that's just not possible because of the nature of the charitable purpose that you're dealing with that might benefit absolutely everyone in society. So the, um, the decisions you're making will necessarily advantage the people um, that are in the room. But in general, if there's really clear evidence of independence to that decision, that can be acceptable. But it's a really a case by case basis on what we can accept um, at charity services. Um, but Vicky might have some more thoughts on this. Vicky, have we still got you online? You have got me. Um, it's an area that um, is really, really. I'm not going to say contentious, but one one of the um, things that I'm very much aware of, and I've actually had um, some independent inquiries um, just yesterday, in fact, on fees here. There, there's there's marking of appropriate fees and, and I think it's something that um, I've been doing a lot of work in the space um, just as trustees generally and and what I think is going to be really important is that as, as a general 
proposition within charities as within other trusts, some benchmarking of standard fee ranges, because I think that is going to provide a lot of protection for trustees. And at the moment, there's huge uncertainty. And I'm getting inquiries like this from, you know, from highly, you know, highly educated, you know, highly, you know, technically qualified professionals down to, you know, people who are, you know, it's because it's something they feel, you know, passionate about. And I can't even point people to anywhere as to what's appropriate. I know from my involvement with different trustees, you know, what the kind of going range is um, and the range is hugely variant. And I think it's an area where there needs to be development of accepted principles regarding fees because that's going to protect everybody it's certainly from my view it's a real work in progress and if anyone out there wants to email me their views on fees or what they charge or what they know is being charged um, my email address is at the end of my powerpoint presentation um, i'd love to hear from you because i'm actively collating information on fee charges to try and start creating some form of benchmarking Vicky, I think that's fantastic. And um, I know we have about 900 uh, attending the call today. If everyone, or if even half those emailed you, it'd be a fantastic uh, resource, wouldn't it? Hugely. And, there, um, and like I say, I love these um, Q&As because it allows people to ask questions that they wouldn't normally uh, do in a in a venue. Um, and maybe this is for you, Andrew. Um, I've got a question that um, a person's involved with a charity or... Um, assist with a charity and they have the word trust in their name but they don't believe they are, are actually a trust and they're just wondering how they might uh, determine that or not. That is a great question it's something we do face quite a lot. Um, there's def different ways of going about figuring this out so the first thing is read your rules documents and um, Vicky talks a little bit about um, I'm going to get a little bit loyally here but the three certainties of trust that are in the trust acts um, so that's that's um, if you see that if you see the word trust and some property is put aside for on trust, that's a good indication you've met the intention of trust. So that means you've kind of got that. If you've got something like we put two dollars aside for this um, purpose, then you've got the um, you've got the subject matter of trust. Um, and the third is making sure you've got a purpose of trust, which most charities will have in their rules document. If you've got those three, that's probably a pretty good indication you are a trust. Um, if you're still confused, if you're looking at rules document, you just have no idea, don't hesitate. If you're a charity, um, get in contact with charity services. We're happy to have a quick look at your rules document um, and talk you through whether or not um, we consider you are a trust um, or, um, or um, you can talk to your lawyer who will definitely let you know. Thank you, uh, Andrew. That's great advice. Um, I have another one which I might uh, direct to you as well, um, again at a very general level, and it asks what duties can I delegate to other people and what do I have to do myself? And I'm imagining this as, as a trustee. That is a great question. This is this is one of the areas of the Trust Act, which is actually, um, I'm, all, I'm, all, I'm almost tempted to punt this across to, to Vicky because this is, this is quite a tough one. Um, basically, if um, the, there are key duties you cannot delegate, which are essentially your duties as a trustee, things like um, things like appointing new trustees, winding up your trust, um, but um, but most things you can, most things like the oper the operational um, activities of your trust, you can um, as long as you've got, um, you've got the powers, you can um, delegate those to your chief executive to get the job done. Um, but I might pass to Vicky because I know there's some complexities in the trust acts in relation to this. Um, it, it is. It's a really, and again, it's probably a session in itself. There are a lot of nuances around delegation. There are all are areas where trustees can delegate in certain circumstances, absence from New Zealand um, or a tempor temporary very physical or mental incapacity, providing there has been a, an appropriate a deed of delegation that meets the requirements. And this is provided for in the Trusts Act. However, you've got to look at what the terms of the trust deed are, because under those default duties, the terms of the Trust Act and the terms of the trust instrument, you can end up with a different, you could have two seemingly identical situations, but end up with different things you can and can't do. But the delegation is 
it's, it's really important to get it right because what it goes back to, and it almost links into majority decision making, trustees take on liability for those decisions collectively. And when there's delegation, while it's very attractive at times to delegate everything because it's inconvenient or someone can't do it, you also got to remember that that doesn't negate the trustees' responsibilities and what they can take liability for. And it's a fundamental premise of trust law that in the first instance, trustees act personally. De delegation is an important practical tool, but it's got to be managed quite carefully. And you've got to look quite carefully at what you're delegating and whether it's appropriate. Because sometimes, even if you can delegate, take a breath and say, should we? Because you've got to remember that as trustees, you've got to expect to retain ultimate liability for those decisions. And there are certain rules where you're observing the outcome of delegation, but it is quite specialised and real care is required. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Vicky. And I, I'm going to, uh, Andrew, you had something to say there, I saw. Yeah, yeah, I just, I just, um, um, a colleague just sent me something through, which I think is quite, I think a good example is a charity, most charities employ accountants to, um, their accounts and submits their annual return to charity services but that doesn't mean that the charities officers aren't still legally responsible for making sure the accounts are prepared that they meet financial reporting standards and any other relevant legislation and they're submitted on time so the yeah the trust trustees still maintain that legal obligation so that's really important to remember okay and now we have a question from mike from me <laughs> so uh, i'll identify myself on this one i want to go to you first vicky and what i'm concerned about in this sector is uh, if we make these duties incredibly onerous and strict and rigid are we you know are we seeing a reduction in people willing to take on um, a trusteeship or are we seeing professionals like you vicky um recommending to people not to take them on so i'll go to you first vicky we are seeing a huge reduction in trustees being prepared to take on trusteeships, although perhaps surprisingly, not so much in the charitable space. And I think that's more because a professional who takes on a charitable appointment as a charitable trustee, it's more because that charity is perhaps aligned with their values. And so I'm actually not seeing very, very many professionals moving away from charitable appointments. But what I am seeing is a huge reduction and trustees stepping away from appointments for discretionary trusts, in part because of the the, the realization now of you know there's a lot more involved in this than what I thought, because we've had this historical clip the ticket mentality where the lawyer or the accountant is also the trustee. And so what that means is that that's been the way those trusts have been developed and generated. Charitable trusts are far less commonly in that mould. And so I don't see it as much of a problem. But I think moving forward, getting good quality trustees is going to become an increasing challenge. But, but I, and I think to take it to the next step, for those smaller charities who might be struggling, one of the things I think isn't considered enough is consolidation or looking for a like-minded charity where you might resettle from one to the other. You know, one of the trustees might become a trustee of, of the new trust. And I think to, that we've got a lot of fragmentation in the charity, charity space, and I'd really invite Andrew's views here. I think there's no shame in a charity saying, we really stand behind what, what we do, but the costs are becoming disproportionate to our resources. Are there other options? And one of those is we settling um, onto a trust or transferring your assets to the control of a trust that, that shares the vision so they can be more are cost effectively managed. I don't know what Andrew's thoughts are, but, but that. Over to you, Andrew. Um, I, th I think it's something that charities should be always considering how to work better together, whether it's the most efficient use of their resources to exist independently or start a new group. It's something all charities should think about. But I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to um, want to think, um, see people not becoming charitable trustees. I think it's a really important part of our society. And in a way, it's a great thing that people are officers of charities. And there are so many people in New Zealand, um, I think like 150,000 or something, um, um, New Zealanders, officers of charities. Um, and, and there are ways you can, you can get the knowledge you need um, without um, without it being that worrying, I think sometimes when we have these webinars and talk the lawyer language, it can be a bit 
bit worrying, but a lot of these um, requirements that we're describing aren't that complicated when you when you break it down. Um, and for most small charities, they aren't actually going to be that burdensome. Um, we've got a one pager on our website, like the, the key things you need to know as a tr an officer of a trustee. It's one page. It's got all the, it's got about 10 due to 10 main things you should think about. And I'd recommend um, both if you're an officer and trustee looking at yourself, but also giving it to your um, trustees um, and thinking about um, that as the, the basis of, of why you're doing things. I mean, I, I say that, yeah, I do recognize that some of these things are quite burdensome and it's something that obviously we'll, we'll continue to think about ways to make it easier for charities to be officers in this space. Thank you. And um, Vicky and Andrew have been fantastic. Um, we're getting towards the end of our hour. Um, Vicky, I might ask you just one final comment. Is there a takeaway that people should, a single takeaway or a, the prime takeaway um, they should keep in their mind after listening to this webcast? I think the prime takeaway is that, I, I agree with what Andrew says, we, not, nothing we've said today is to make it sound like, you know, being involved with a charity is a burden. It's an incredibly important part of society. It's an incredibly important part of New Zealand's culture. And that is why, by head of capita, the same as we have more discretionary family trusts per head of capita than anywhere else in the world, I've done some research in the space that indicates, similarly with charities we have and charitable trusts, we have more, you know, by head of capita than pretty much anywhere in the world. The takeaway is that there's enormous advice available to charities at Charity Services. They do an amazing job of putting information out there to facilitate charities doing what they do. But I think the simple thing is don't be afraid just the trust act was put out there it's supposedly plain english some of you might have a little giggle and say if they think that's plain english well then please show me the complicated english but the point of it is it's supposed to make it clear what your duties are in a way that's meaningful and and if in doubt, you, there are resources out there you know charitable services i have a trust blog which is freely available where I have a lot of information about trusts and charitable trusts. There's a lot of inf quality information you can get that doesn't require you paying for it. And but, but when you know you're out of your depth and you'll know you know because you're not sleeping at night worrying about you need to reach out to a lawyer and many lawyers, particularly for small charities, will offer concessional rates because it's part of, you know, is, you know, contribution to society. But, you know, we're here to help and we can be very reasonable when we know there's genuine need. Thank you very much and a great message. Um, Andrew, uh, a final um, take out from you. I, yeah, I won't say anything more. I think that was, that was great covered. Also, um, just so people are aware, some community law centres do offer um, free um, advice to charities, not all, but um, it's worth checking in with your community law centre um, and they can be really helpful. And they've got the community law manual as well, which is a really useful resource to understand some of your legal obligations. So we'll recommend that. Okay. Well, um, Vicky and Andrew, thank you very much for today. Um, I'm seeing some questions coming up. Vicky, um, I know your website is, at the, is up there now. Vicky at VATL. Dot nz um, and uh, information about um, trustee fees um, you'd love to have a comment uh, to that email address as well I would love it and I've already seen in the chat someone putting fees through so much appreciated and if there's any questions that weren't answered today or weren't clear feel free to email me I'm happy to respond Thank you. Now, um, this webinar will be published on, um, is, is being recorded and will be published on the Chartered Accountants ANZ and the Charity Services website. Um, and if you're a charity and you don't have access to, uh, you're not a Chartered Accountant, you can go to uh, www.charities.govt.nz and look at the webinars page and you'll be able to see this or um, you could recommend this to someone else. Um, the other thing is, um, Andrew and I have a long history of, uh, of charitable uh, activities and initiatives around New Zealand, and we'd love to um, see what else um, you'd like in this space if you enjoyed it. Um, and if that's the case, you could uh, email um, events at charities.govt.nz with your suggestions. 
Uh, now, um, to the chartered accountants on the call, um, we do a, a sharing knowledge session every week and we try and keep it in this 12 to 1 slot um, and we generate them out of the organisation. I'm very keen in promoting the ones I do. Um, I have another one in two weeks time on Friday the 28th and we're looking at uh, a subject that um, might be topical for charities as well. We're looking at the impacts that COVID and work from home are having on commercial property in the metro and regional areas. So uh, Namihi, thanks again and hopefully we'll see you at the next one. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too.